Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Murray Fulton. I'm um, here to introduce Wayne Simpson. Um, I'm uh, assuming that the people in Regina can um, can hear me. If not, um, let me know. Um, it uh, gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce um, Wayne um, to you. Um, I knew of Wayne. I've known Wayne for for actually quite some time now. I'm actually new of Wayne much much earlier than um, I um, had met him. Um, we were talk Wayne and I were talking about this this morning. Um, our mothers uh, worked together over in the um, uh, this is continuing nursing education, um, and they worked together for for many many years. It was a um, I, I think it was a match made in heaven. They were a, a powerful. Um, Sort of one-two punch. Uh, it was uh, it was quite the uh, quite the thing to watch the two of them in action. So I, I've known Wayne for um, known of Wayne and um, and then known Wayne for for some time. Um, as you're going to see this afternoon, uh, what um, um, Wayne's going to be talking about is um, a little bit of um, applied um, economics. And um, as, as you're about to hear, um, I think Wayne's one of these sort of quintessential sort of applied economist takes good economic theory um, and applies it to really important um, policy questions. Um, and um, in the case of Wayne, these are, have mostly been in the area of, of labor. Um, Wayne is currently a professor of economics at the University of Manitoba. He is a graduate of the University of Saskatchewan um, and the London School of Economics. He is, a, he is a specialist in labor economics, applied microeconomics, quantitative methods, and social policy. He's worked for the Bank of Canada, the Economic Council of Canada. He is the author of um, numerous books and reports, including Urban Structure in the Labor Market, Analysis of Worker Mobility, Commuting, and Underemployment in Cities. Co-author with Derek Hum of Income Maintenance, Work Effort, and the Canadian Mincome Experiment and maintaining a competitive workforce. He's also published more than 50 refereed articles in economics and policy journals and numerous in technical research reports, book chapters, and other publications. He is currently a member of the editorial board of Canadian Public Policy. Um, his topic uh, is, um, I think, dead on for the School of Public Policy, um, namely the effectiveness of balanced budget legislation Lessons from Western Canada. Wayne, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, uh, for coming. Um, I should uh, credit that most of this work was done with uh, Jared Wesley, who is a political scientist, or was a political scientist at the University of Manitoba. Uh, he has uh, gone back to, the, to Edmonton. He works now for the government of Alberta. And I suppose he would like me to say on his behalf that Nothing that uh, I say here today uh, should be attributed to the views of the, uh, the government of Alberta. Um, and uh, Jared got me into this topic, and I thought, well, there's some interesting questions here. And uh, you can see, I'm going to use this uh, pointer on the computer. I'm not sure how well it's going to work. You can see the cartoon here, which I'll read to you. A student uh, is talking to his father. It says, today in math class, we learned all about negative numbers from a guest lecturer who works in the federal budget office. And I don't know the date of this uh, cartoon. It's from the New York, uh, the New Yorker archives of cartoons. And it doesn't have a date on it. But I suspect it comes from the late 80s or the early 90s. Because the sense people were getting was that governments were going to run deficits forever. Um, right through the stagflation of the 70s and into the 80s and into the early 90s through a couple of fairly significant recessions, uh, governments uh, across North America have been running uh, deficits. And the public mood began to uh, change, and therefore the political mood began to change towards the notion that uh, something ought to be done about this, and or else we're going to have gigantic interest payments, gigantic debts, and, uh, and real problems down the road. And so this led to uh, a spate of balanced budget legislation. Uh, and the question I'm asking is, uh, how effective has this uh, been? And is it a good idea to uh, continue it? And if so, in what, uh, in what form? And I'll partially answer some of those questions or try to answer some of those questions today. Um, 
So the outline of the talk is that, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit in background on balanced budget legislation, and I'm going to focus on Western Canada and talk a little bit about why Western Canada is interesting. The analysis uh, is, uh, first of all, a quantitative analysis, which includes not only Western Canada, but also the uh, other Canadian provinces, uh, from 1989 to 2009, a period which covers the institution of balanced budget legislation in seven of the Canadian provinces, uh, and then a qualitative assessment of how balanced budget legislation has done in Western Canada uh, under the Great Recession, which hit in 2009. And I do this in the form of what I call seven lessons. And then I talk a little bit about the way forward in the sense of uh, what we might have learned from all this and uh, options for the future. So where do we find balanced budget legislation? Well, um, the simple answer is, except at the federal level in North America, just about everywhere. Balanced budget legislation exists in seven of the ten Canadian provinces, all but the three easternmost provinces. It exists in some form or another uh, in 49 of the U.S. states, and uh, by my count, 41 of them, it's in the Constitution in some form as a constitutional amendment. Um, but the analysis of this has been... Uh, limited, at least in Canada, there has been some study of balanced budget legislation in the context of the general fiscal management strategies of the provinces. Uh, there has also been some detailed study of Alberta, but there's been very little done as a whole on balanced budget legislation in, uh, among the Canadian provinces. Uh, why should we be interested in, in balanced budget legislation? Um, well, first of all, we're not just going to focus on Western Canada in the quantitative analysis. It's going to include all the Canadian provinces. First, the seven provinces in Canada that have uh, balanced budget legislation, and then uh, the other three that don't will be added as well as controls later on in the analysis, just to see how robust the empirical results are. Uh, but in the qualitative analysis, uh, the focus is on Western Canada, and I think there are some interesting reasons uh, for looking at the West. One is, uh, in terms of uh, balanced budget legislation, it, Western Canada is the incubator of balanced budget legislation. We're the first ones on the scene on the Prairie Provinces. Um, we have uh, some of the most stringent balanced budget legislation. Manitoba's, when it was passed, was considered to be the most comprehensive, at least in Canada. Uh, and we have diverse governing philosophies. We have social credit, uh, progressive conservatives, Saskatchewan Party, NDP and Liberals, all uh, governing during this period, all passing legislation, and four of those five governments trying to deal with this legislation as it confronted the Great Recession. So what is balanced budget legislation? Well, first and foremost, it is um, a rule about uh, whether you can run a deficit, and if so, how long you can run a deficit. So there's deficit avoidance over a specified period, which could be the fiscal cycle, the fiscal year, uh, or it could be a longer period, um, in both Manitoba and Saskatchewan, we've had episodes where the balanced budget legislation has been over a four-year cycle, which seems to me to cover more of an electoral cycle than a business cycle, but uh, nevertheless gives some flexibility to run deficits in some years, provided that they're offset by surpluses in other years. Then, uh, because there will inevitably be these uh, cyclical downturns that uh, must occur, and we'd be foolish to think that they, uh, they aren't going to occur in the future, there has to be the creation of some contingency or stabilization reserves. This is equivalent to the, the household that has savings because it has a volatile income stream. If it wants to smooth its consumption, it has to have uh, savings or it has to borrow. And if you don't allow borrowing, that is to say you don't allow deficits, then uh, there has to be a savings account. And that is called a fiscal stabilization reserve or, or some related name. Uh, then there, the objective of this uh, balanced budget legislation in many cases was to get budgets in balance to run surpluses so that at least some of that surplus could be used to pay off debt. And so there are typically debt repayment guarantees in the balanced budget legislation uh, along with other commitments on the use of surplus funds typically talking about the sharing between fiscal stabilization funds and debt repayment. Um, there are also uh, rules in the balanced budget legislation especially later on talk about our so-called third generation uh, exercises, uh, regulating expenditure and taxation. Uh, things, especially on the taxation side, for example, saying that there must be public consultation, typically in the form of a referendum before major tax increases 
Parker. There's some discussion of expenditure limitations. Saskatchewan talks about not limiting expenditure growth on the civil service to the growth of the population. Um, and there's some commitment to consistent accounting practices, which not only attempt to modernize accounting practices, but also to define what those practices should be and to prevent accounting practices from being the vehicle by which governments uh, move from year to year uh, to budget balance. In other words, if you balance a budget one year with a certain practice, the expectation is you balance it the next year with the same practice. So um, TAP has given us, uh, he did a paper for the Parliamentary Budget Office and it uh, talks about the three stages of balanced budget legislation. Um, the first stage is not really balanced budget legislation. This is legislation that was passed that concentrates on spending restraint and talks about uh, intentions to balance budgets. And this is BC and Alberta in the early 90s. Then there are the second generation rules in the mid to late 90s which actually address budget balance. Talk about uh, actually balancing the budget year to year over a specified cycle. Talk about uh, doing it over a prescribed period of time. Um, and I date these as the actual implementation of balanced budget legislation. For the quantitative exercise, we have to identify a before and after. We have to identify a point at which balanced budget legislation comes in. And I identify these second generation pieces of legislation as the uh, introduction of balanced budget legislation. And then third generation rules uh, the current regimes which often combine the balanced budget leg legislation with uh, debt management rules, restrictions on revenue growth, and other sorts of tinkering that I'll talk about uh, briefly without going into too many details. So this is a, a synopsis, if you will, of the balanced budget legislation as it has come into being in the four western provinces. Um, if you look, for example, at Alberta, look at Alberta, you can see first of all that there is uh, what I would call a first generation balanced budget uh, legislation which uh, talks about deficit elimination. So Alberta said in 93 that over the course of the next four years by 1997 we're going to have our budget balanced. Well that's not really balanced budget legislation, it's really talking about targets and you can miss those targets. But in fact uh, times were good enough or they were conservative enough that they actually balanced their budget by 95. So in 1995, Alberta introduced the Balanced Budget and Debt Retirement Act, which is their second generation legislation. And uh, this is when they really said for the first time that the budget must be balanced each and every year. Um, this was accompanied by the Alberta Taxpayer Protection Act that year as well, which put some limits on, on uh, methods of raising revenue and so on I'll talk about. And then they introduced their third generation legislation, which is the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act in 2000. This is all, here we go again. Here, here this is all um, the same government, progressive conservative government, which has endured in Alberta for a long period of time. Um, there also in Saskatchewan and Manitoba were parallel developments in 95, what I would call again second generation legislation, the Balanced Budget Act. And then the third generation are tinkering with the act, the Fiscal Stabilization Fund Act in 2000, again under the NDP, and under the Saskatchewan Party in 2008, the Growth and Financial Security Act. Uh, Manitoba, 1995, as I said at the time, this was considered the most comprehensive legislation in Canada. The Balanced Budget, Debt Repayment and Taxpayer Protection Act um, came in. That was their sec our second generation act. Uh, no preliminaries like Alberta. and. Uh, then third generation tinkering in 2008 under the New Democrats, uh, Balanced Budget, Fiscal Management and Taxpayer Accountability Act. British Columbia had a first generation act in 1991 under the Social Credit. This bill lasted about one year. The New Democrats returned to power and uh, immediately got rid of it. Uh, they returned to balanced budget legislation in 2000 of a somewhat different sort that I'll talk a little bit about. And the reasons why that is the case are quite uh, I think, instructive. Um, and then the Balanced Budget and Ministerial Accountability Act in 2001 under the, uh, under the Liberals. So you can see that uh, some of these changes, the third generation changes, are that there's a change of government and at least after a time they want their own stamp on that. It may have been part of the election promises they made uh, where they saw there were improvements that they could be made. It may have been that they wanted to be seen to be tougher on budget balance than existed before and so on. Um, 
and so uh, when you get changes of government, you've typically get, gotten changes of legislation. But the fundamental institution of balanced budget legislation on the prairies is 1995 for Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta, and in 2000 for BC. Um, I think it's important to think about when badge, uh, balanced budget legislation is instituted because um, uh, this is part of the uh, question about how we go about evaluating uh, balanced budget legislation. And the point I want to make here is that governments are rational uh, agents in the sense that they are architects of the politically feasible. Um, so if you say to someone, uh, what's the measure of success of balanced budget legislation? And they say, well, uh, they introduced balanced budget legislation and they got a surplus and they had surpluses for three or four years, I would say, well, duh. They knew that the economy was moving into uh, a period of um, uh, strong economic growth. Uh, they looked at their revenue and spending projections, and they saw that they were moving into a surplus situation. They instituted balanced budget legislation, intending it to, to go forward into the uh, far future, but for them, the far future might be the next election cycle. So that isn't really a very long period of time. So the uh, upshot of that is that um, the outcomes of balanced budget legislation I don't think can be judged by short-term outcomes. In other words, whether they balance the budget and produce surpluses in the few years after they instituted the act, which would have occurred anyways. But it turns on the question of whether the fiscal behavior of governments actually changed when balanced budget legislation was in introduced. Um, the intent of balanced budget legislation, as uh, my colleague Jared Wesley said, was it gives governments a chance to say no to spending initiatives and to rein in expenditures because they have this legislation that says they have to balance their budget. Um, and if that's the case, what we should see is we should see the growth in spending being reined in relative to the growth in revenue. And that's the measure that I, uh, that I look at. So if we look at the budgetary positions of the provinces, the four western provinces, as a percentage of total revenue. This is from 1989 to 2008 using the, the uh, fiscal management system data from Statistics Canada that I'll use in the quantitative analysis. Um, what you'll see here, what I want to point out, is that in the period leading up to 1995, you have some initial forays into balanced budget legislation, which I called the first generation ones, which basically said, We'd like to get to budget balance. It'll probably take us a few years. We set up deficit reduction targets. And Alberta and BC did that. Um, by 1995, the three prairie provinces were moving into surplus. And uh, they could see it coming. They've got, they pay people to see it coming for them if they can't see it. And the governments uh, passed balanced budget legislation and realized a series of surpluses. This is the uh, surplus position at 0%. Uh, through the rest of the 1990s. Look at British Columbia. British Columbia, on the other hand, it's the red dotted line. Uh, when it looks at 1995, it's coming close to balanced budget, but it doesn't get there. So what does B British Columbia do? British Columbia defers balanced budget legislation. And in fact, they suff suffer a fairly sharp contraction of uh, revenues and therefore a, a real budget surplus deficit problem in 1999. By 2000, they've recovered from that. And looking forward, what they do is pass legislation which says that we're not going to balance our budget in 2000 or 2001, but we're going to balance our budget by 2004, 2005. And that, in fact, is a pretty good guess because that's just about when they did. Uh, there's a fairly mild recession in 2001, uh, which all the provinces survive. Uh, there's the tinkering with the balanced budget legislation from 2001 to 2008, and as I've described, the different uh, acts, a lot of it involving changes of government. Um, but all of the governments running reasonably uh, healthy surpluses, with the exception of Manitoba, where the, the surplus is pretty anemic, leading up to 2008. And then, of course, in 2008, 2009, we have the uh, Great Recession hitting. So the quantitative analysis will cover the period from 89, the 88-89 fiscal year to the 2008-2009 fiscal year. And then we'll look at the Great Recession that followed from that. I should say the fiscal management system data that I use um, is phased out in 2008-2009. So uh, 
that's a convenient one because it straddles the balanced budget legislation, but it also stops right at the point of, of the uh, Great Recession. So the second generation legislation, again, just briefly, just looking at the main features of the Act. Um, Alberta, balance the budget annually, eliminate the debt in 25 years, limit expenditure and revenue growth, and because in Alberta the uh, push button issue has always been the institution of a provincial sales tax, it's, it's the fruit that's hanging out there if somebody needs to increase revenues, they, part of the legislation is a referendum on approval of the introduction of a provincial sales tax. In Saskatchewan and Manitoba you will probably know that the, the uh, push button issue has typically been the sell off of Crown Corporations. So both of them have things in there which say that you can't uh, sell off the Crown Corporation, use the proceeds to balance the budget. Saskatchewan's Act, Balanced Budget Act in 95, says the balance will not be annual, but over four years. So this is a different uh, electoral cycle related uh, balancing feature rather than a, uh, an annual balancing feature. Um, no accounting changes or Crown Corp sell off to the balanced budget. And then major identifiable unanticipated disasters would preclude a balanced budget. So there are some escape hatches if things happen that you would not have, uh, would have not have normally anticipated. And I'll talk a little bit about one or two of those. The Manitoba uh, Repayment and Taxpayer Protection Act said annual balance both on operating and capital. So it was the most severe in terms of, most severe in terms of what, um, uh, what actually is being balanced, most comprehensive. Uh, Manitoba would retire the debt within 30 years, uh, referendum for major tax increases, and deficits were permissible again, this is the escape hatch, if war disaster or had a revenue decline of 5% or more. Manitoba also introduced ministerial penalties. The first year that the budget is not balanced, the ministerial component of the salary would be cut by 20%. Uh, second and subsequent years be cut by 40%. And there would be public hearings to amend or repeal the Act, but not to suspend the Act because it was suspended without public hearings. Um, the British Columbia Balanced Budget Act uh, didn't say we're going to balance the budget because remember their budgetary position was still fairly fragile in 2000. It said the progressive deficit reduction to balance the budget by 2004-2005 and they also instituted a 20% penalty on, uh, on ministers if the budget was not balanced. The third generation tinkering, again, just some changes or fe novel features of the different acts uh, briefly. Uh, British Columbia 2001, their, their new act introduced um, individual ministry incentives. What it said was that there's a penalty of 20% to each minister if the overall budget is not balanced, if you run a deficit. If your ministry balance uh, budget is balanced, you get half of that back. So that was an in innovative feature that uh, only British Columbia has had so far. Alberta set a, uh, established a target for its stabilization fund. It said that the fiscal cushion, the fiscal stabilization fund by whatever name, should be 3.5% of revenues. And I think that's an interesting number because what strikes me is that 3.5% is not going to be nearly enough to deal with anything any sort of significant recession. So that's probably a fairly uh, modest number to, uh, to have in terms of your, your savings account for uh, future uh, downturns in income. Uh, Saskatchewan in 2008 uh, went from a four-year budget balance. Remember they had a budget, the budget had to be balanced over four years. The sum of the, sur of the surpluses and deficits over any four-year period had to be greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero. Um, and they said, uh, instead, we'll have an annual balance, consistent with what uh, Manitoba and, uh, and Alberta were doing. Uh, a rainy day stabilization fund, which would take half of any surplus. So it could build to be more than 3.5%. But it also didn't give any discretion to where, how the surplus funds were built up or how much money went on the debt. It simply said it would be split 50-50. And they limit serv civil service uh, employment growth to population growth. So that's an expenditure constraint. Manitoba uh, went from an annual balance, which they had before. The NDP said, we'll balance the budget over four years. So they went to the Saskatchewan model, if you will. Uh, they modernized the accounting procedures and um, 
uh, had them reported over beyond the core operations to include uh, pension shortfalls and whatnot. And they, uh, I think an interesting feature of the Manitoba legislation is the introduction of an annual fiscal management strategy which had to not only be produced but had to be assessed. So they talked essentially about the fiscal position of the province. Um, and that gives some transparency to where the province thinks the, uh, uh, the deficit and debt are going and allows the public to make judgments about whether that's a, a reasonable strategy or not. It opens them obviously to some criticism if it's not. Um, so what about the flexibility and rigidity in these, uh, this balanced budget legislation? There's certainly typically some flexibility. There's escape clauses for un unpredictable catastrophic events. Uh, the BSE mad cow which affected the three prairie provinces, the forest fires in 2003, the H1N1 flu epidemic were all cases where documented expenditures on those particular things didn't count towards the uh, budget balancing exercise. Um, there's multi-year balancing provisions originally in Saskatchewan and now in Manitoba. And then the most important, the development of these rainy day fiscal stabilization funds which are typically intended to deal with uh, cyclical downturns. But there's also rigidity. Um, wrong way. Uh, the limitations include the accounting procedures. They acts typically set out the types of accounting procedures that have to be used uh, and the fact that you can't change the accounting procedures uh, and balance your budget in that fashion. There are limitations on the sale of Crown Corporations to achieve a budget balance in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Referendums for tax increases in British Columbia, Alberta and Manitoba. Um, there are also some expenditure constraints of the sort that Saskatchewan introduced on, on uh, civil service employment. Um, there are some clear instructions on the use of surplus funds which basically say that you've got to put so much of it towards the debt uh, and you've got to put so much of it towards the uh, development of a fiscal stabilization uh, fund. And then in Manitoba and British Columbia there are these penalties for ministers if the budget is not balanced. Um, so the qu one question is does the balanced budget legislation have the right mix of uh, flexibility and rigidity to make it work? Um, uh, so uh, my question is have the governments aligned their expenditure and revenue growth to sustain a budget balance and have they uh, done it in a fashion that would allow them to accumulate sufficient surplus funds to uh, withstand a recession. So now the quantitative analysis. This is revenue and expenditure growth under the balanced budget legislation uh, looking at the period before the balanced budget starting in the 8089 fiscal year up to 2008-2009. And we asked the question about whether uh, there's been a discernible fiscal impact essentially in terms of whether we've aligned expenditure and revenue growth to avoid deficit and to finance uh, any shortfalls from accumulated fiscal stabilization reserves. The data is Statistics Canada's financial management system um, which is designed to produce consistent and compatible provincial accounts on a fiscal year basis which wasn't available before that. Uh, allows statistical comparisons of provincial expenditures and revenues before and after the implementation of balanced budget legislation in the West. And in this analysis we also include, uh, although we don't focus on the results of the three uh, eastern provinces that have balanced budget legislation which is New Brunswick 95, Ontario 99, back in 2002 and in the controls that I use some of the controls are the non-balanced budget uh, provinces. The econometric model that I use is uh, what I call a panel spline regression model and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at essentially the growth of revenue, growth of real per capita revenue and I'm going to look at the growth of real per capita expenditure and I'm going to compare the two. So this, it does allow for inflation, it does allow for population growth. So the fact that some provinces like Alberta grew fast in terms of population is accounted for by using per capita figures. The fact that some provinces experience more inflation than others is accounted for by using provincial uh, GDP inflation figures. Um, and I'm going to explain the uh, growth in revenue uh, or expenditure in terms of the following factors. Um, there's going to be a, a 
province-specific constant term. So everything's going to be in terms of a specific province. I'm going to combine the provinces um, and the time periods from 88, 89 to 2008, 2009. So I've got 21 years and I've got uh, the seven balanced budget legislation provinces combined. Um, and I'm going to explain it in terms of a trend term, which is really the trend over the entire period. And then I'm going to have another term, which is my spline term, which simply captures the change in the uh, growth rate of revenue expenditure after the introduction of balanced budget legislation. So the idea of a spline, um, if you've forgotten or not familiar, is essentially all it does is it takes two line segments and brings them together at a point. And the point I'm going to bring them together at is the point of introduction of the second generation balanced budget legislation in 95 on the prairies in 2000 in BC and so on. And that is this date here. This BI is the provincial balanced budget date. And this is the annual data for uh, before and after that, uh, that introduction. And then I have in some of the uh, analysis, I have controls, control variables. I go again. And the control variables include uh, the three non-balanced budget provinces, the provincial growth rate, growth rate of gross domestic product, and um, I've forgotten what I th my third one is. Oh yes, the uh, provincial affiliations, the governments. So I, I, I mark out what government's in power at which point in time. So I've got those three control variables. So the quantitative analysis uh, is uh, from 88 to 09, as I said. And the key variable, maybe I should go back one, the key variable is this beta 2i, which is the province specific change in, in uh, real per capita revenue or expenditure, uh, the change in that growth rate between the before and after periods of balanced budget legislation. I'm going to key on that figure, and that's the results that I'm going to produce. Uh, there's uh, two sets of results. There's results for the seven provinces, only the seven provinces with balanced budget legislation. If I run this model for those seven provinces or I run seven separate splines for the seven provinces, I get the same results. Right? It's, it's, it's just uh, the same. But I can also add control variables and I do that in a second set of results just to see if there's some uh, robustness to these results. And then um, I also do this um, for two different definitions of revenues, all revenues against all expenditures, and then two different uh, definitions of expenditures, I do own source uh, revenues against program only expenditures. So I compare first of all the overall budget balance, and then I look at the things which are most under provincial control, which are own source revenues and program expenditures. So these are the results. Um, and Let's start with Manitoba, not because I'm from there, but because um, if we look at the figure, for Manitoba balances budget in 95. So if we compare the, for all revenues and all expenditures, for all revenues we compare the marginal effect of balanced budget legislation. We're looking at the change in the growth rate of real per capita revenues before and after the balanced budget legislation. That's what that coefficient gives us on, the Manito on Manitoba. And it basically shows that revenues are flat. That revenue growth before balanced budget legislation and after balanced budget legislation in 95 are virtually the same. It's about as close to zero as I can find anywhere in these tables. On the other hand, expenditures grew by about a half a percent. Well, if you're thinking about balanced budget legislation, what you'd like to see if, if you think that they're going to have to build up these surpluses to withstand a recession is you expect the opposite. You'd expect if revenues are flat that they're going to have to curtail expenditures. So this number is going to have to be negative. So what I have in the final column is I have taken the difference between the growth in expenditures and the growth in revenues. And that is 0.44%. So the, the lesson here is a positive number is bad because I'm subtracting expenditure growth from revenue growth. Uh, a negative number is good because a negative number means that your growth of, your growth of expenditure 
after balanced budget legislation is small losing growth of revenues. And the case of that is British Columbia. They passed the legislation in 2000. The revenues after 2000 grew 0.66% faster than, their, um, than they did before 2000. But their expenditures grew 2% slower. So that's good. I mean, the intent of legislation is that you're going to curtail expenditures. Because if you don't, when the time comes that you have to pay for a recession, or if this simply, or you want to put money down on your debt, eventually you're not going to be able to do either of those things. And so this negative number here in red is, is good. This, in, to me, indicates that this balanced budget legislation has been effective in British Columbia, and it has curtailed um, their spending relative to their revenues. Now, the reason I compare it to revenues is because, of course, in a lot of cases, there are differences in revenue growth after the advent of balanced budget legislation. And you wouldn't expect if a, if a province uh, realizes a substantial improvement in revenue growth, like Saskatchewan, there's a 1% improvement in revenue growth, and that gives them some room to maneuver. So you'd expect the growth in spending to be something less than 1%. That would still produce a negative number. But of course, it's slightly, it's about the same. So Saskatchewan on this book is, is pretty much neutral. It, it's, it's increase in spending and it's increase in revenue after the 95 balanced budget legislation are the same. Uh, Alberta is the, um, the spendthrift, if you will. I don't often call out them that. But uh, they had a 0.56% reduction in revenue growth after 95. But their all expenditures have grown by 2.2% a year since then, uh, faster than they did before 95. And that differential then is 2.75%. So that's a pretty big number. The other provinces, just briefly, are mixed. Uh, Ontario is uh, the only other one that brings a negative number. Negatives are good, remember, in terms of effectiveness. Positives are bad. Um, I do the mean marginal effect. For the West, revenues, this is just a simple average of these four numbers, grew by 0.3%. Expenditures grew by 0.44%. So the differential effect is 0.14%, which is positive. So on, on, in total, the growth in spending after the passage of balanced budget legislation outstripped the growth in revenues, which is not a good thing if you think about what the legislation is designed to do. Um, this is with the controls. I've added the, the three uh, non-balanced budget provinces. I've added uh, provincial GDP growth, and I've added uh, the party in power, the, provincial the political affiliation of the party in power. Um, and here, the results are, if anything, a little bit stronger. The negative number of BC is a little bit smaller, and some of these numbers are a little bit larger. And in summary, for the West, um, I have uh, revenue growth 0.35%, but expenditure growth 0.81%, leaving a differential effect of 0.45%. It's a little bigger than last time. So the controls actually make the story um, a little bit stronger that governments uh, have not um, used this legislation to rein in expenditures and do what the legislation was designed ostensibly to do. Now, um, people have suggested to me that you shouldn't look at all expenditures and all revenues because there are things that governments can't control, certainly on the revenue side, in the short term they can't control uh, payments on the debt, and that is the major other component here that we take out when we look at program spending. And on the, uh, on the expenditure side, and on the revenue side, we have um, uh, a number of transfers, principally federal transfers, some of which are tagged, which uh, again the provinces have less control over. So what I've done in the second exercise is taken that uh, uh, advice and I have looked at this for own source revenues and for program spending. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the same comparison, but essentially I've taken out interest payments and I've taken out federal transfers and a few other things that fall into those uh, categories. Um, so now, again, there's no controls this time, so it's like running the seven separate splines on the, on the seven provinces that have balanced budget legislation, looking at the comparing the revenue and, ex and expenditure growth. But now we're looking at own source revenues and program spending. Um, and if you look, well, let's take Saskatchewan again. 
uh, Saskatchewan here, the revenue is fairly flat. So what you'd hope is that program spending would be uh, negative, but in fact it's about 3%. So the differential here is around 3%. Uh, the only province, again, which uh, appears to have restrained spending relative to revenue growth is BC, where uh, own source revenues were, grew by a three quarters of a percent slower after the introduction of balanced budget legislation in 2000, and program spending grew about one and a quarter percent slower. So they're about a half percent to the good in terms of improving their fiscal situation. Um, Manitoba, not doing very well. Alberta, not doing very well at all. They, uh, revenues slowed down by 1.75% and program spending increased by 4.5%. So that suggests an unsustain, all of these suggest unsustainable positions. And the case of Saskatchewan from the standpoint of what we'll talk about in the Great Recession is particularly interesting because they'd be in this category as well. The eastern provinces, now that we have uh, looking only at own source revenues and program spending, again, are all on the plus side. That is to say, uh, spending is outstripping uh, revenues in terms of the growth rates. And for the west, the summary measure is that uh, revenues are down 1%. For versus before the balanced budget legislation. Program spending is up 2%, giving a net differential impact of 3%, which is pretty quickly going to uh, develop into uh, the sorts of fiscal problems you might, uh, might not expect from the legislation itself. With controls, it gets even worse. Um, BC has always been in negative territory in terms of differential impact. It's moved to positive territory. Now it's uh, program spending is uh, about uh, minus a quarter percent, but its revenues are minus a half a percent. And so its differential impact, again, is that its spending is outstripping revenue. And for the other provinces, the same kind of pattern as before. It's just that these numbers in aggregate start getting bigger and bigger, so that now we have own source revenue down about 1%, program spending up 2.5% variables and the differential impact about three and a half percent. So this result is quite robust to the introduction of the kinds of things that you think might matter to the uh, revenue and expenditure patterns of, uh, of governments and suggests that uh, just looking at the, the figures uh, alone does, uh, does tell you quite a bit. The, uh, so the summary here, I think I've pretty much uh, said all this. Uh, the results are stronger when you have own source revenues and program spending. In terms of the control variables, um, GDP growth matters because it does reduce spending requirements. I don't think that's probably a surprise. Uh, in terms of political affiliations, uh, the only thing that comes out is that uh, New Democrats spend more on programs. That's a surprise necessarily. Um, balanced budget legislation, have, as I said, had great pop popularity in the West in 2008. We have these substantial surpluses. Uh, some debt reductions, we have the development of these rainy day funds for the uh, for, for cyclical downturns. Um, and uh, we also have these results which tell us that spending growth in fact outstripped revenue growth uh, for each of the provinces after the introduction of balanced budget legislation. 2001 recession was fairly mild, maybe not a true test, not, nothing like the 80s and 90s recessions. And the question was whether you could withstand a more serious downturn, and you might expect from the results that I produced that the answer would be no. You should probably know that, that is the answer. So I've summarized a great deal of work that uh, Jared Wesley and I did, but mostly Jared Wesley did, on the um, uh, qualitative analysis of what happened during the uh, Great Recession. And I can send you more detail on this if you are interested. We've written up other papers that, uh, that talk about these results. But I've summarized all this in what I call the seven lessons from the Great Recession. The first one is that the governments didn't anticipate these reven these, uh, the recession, the revenue declines that were associated with it. At least nothing as severe has actually happened. They had the 2001 recession, but it was quite mild. But they had the eight recessions in the start of the 80s and the start of the 90s to remind them that these things do periodically occur. Um, the 2009 budget season, the, the uh, late winter of 2009, was filled with all kinds of surprises. 
as revenues fell well below forecast in every province. Um, the, these forecasts, uh, as bad as they were, tended to deteriorate right through 2009 as the 2009-10 budgets folded out. And especially in the provinces where there were significant resource revenues like Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, the revenue uh, forecasts were particularly volatile. Lesson two, governments resisted cuts to program spending and especially to what is referred to as essential services. This is consistent with the evidence we had on program spending. Remember where the program spending outstripped revenues by a substantial margin uh, in the before after comparison. Um, I read out some comments from budgets to illustrate 2009 BC budget. Uh, our priority has been to protect the vital health care, education, social programs that British Columbians have come to rely on. Alberta's 2010 budget, the need to strike the right balance between fiscal discipline and protecting essential services. Manitoba's 2010 budget, the need to ensure our economy is competitive in a way that doesn't leave people behind. At the same time, there was a recognition, I think, that um, the wrong thing to do would be to uh, actually adhere to the legislation, that balanced budget deficit, that um, budget deficits were the way to go, and that um, just as at the federal level, fiscal stimulus measures being introduced, the provinces weren't expected to counteract that by, in fact, not, not running uh, deficits of their own. So the fiscal stimulus idea carried over to the provinces, and most of the provinces adopted the... Uh, Keynesian idea that uh, in a recession like this um, there, was, there was some fiscal stimulus needed to make up for the private demand loss. Thirdly, cuts to non-essential services were inadequate to avoid the deficit. Uh, there were some cuts to uh, civil service uh, salaries and jobs in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. There were some deferred uh, tax cuts, some promised uh, tax cuts that were, uh, were not lived up to. Uh, some cuts in infrastructure spending plans or they were phased out over longer periods of time in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. But these weren't enough and of course they weren't enough because non-essential expenditures of this sort simply aren't a big enough portion of the budget uh, to make a, a difference without really draconian cuts in those budgets because the essential services, health, education, and social services are such a large component of provincial budgets that that is where the bu cuts have to be made if, uh, if go governments are going to, uh, to balance their budgets without significant fiscal stabilization reserves. The flexibility in the legislation was inadequate. Uh, Manitoba's four-year balancing cycle, uh, they didn't give it four year, a chance to last four years. They immediately said in 2009 that we can't balance our budget and we're not likely to over the next four years. And so they suspended the legislation. The other provinces had annual provisions. Um, the disaster provisions helped only a little. I mentioned the H1N1 flu uh, epidemic because it occurred in the winter of 2009, remember? And it gave the provinces a little bit of a degree of flexibility because, for example, in Manitoba, the expenditure figure there was about 90 million to uh, vaccinate uh, people against H1N1 to get the information out and so on. So that could be set aside, and that still wasn't sufficient to uh, balance the budget. And the stabilization funds were often inadequate for a rainy day. I guess Saskatchewan is the exception, but BC, Manitoba, and Alberta uh, were unable to balance their budgets with the, uh, with the stabilization funds. Lesson five, uh, governments could not or would not raise major taxes and had to suspend balanced budget legislation. Well, of course, in, in some of the balanced budget legislation, there were restrictions on raising taxes. If you wanted to raise any major tax um, in provinces like Manitoba or Alberta, you had to conduct uh, public consultations or a referendum. So there were some explicit uh, limitations on ability to raise um, uh, taxes, but governments in general were reluctant to raise taxes in this, uh, in this era. And um, in the balance of the information that, uh, that we collected about, uh, uh, from the provinces about discussions around the budget, we saw governments adopting what I would characterize as a centrist approach, basically uh, regardless of whether it was Liberals in BC, PCs in Alberta, the Saskatchewan Party, or the NDP in Manitoba, they tended to try to balance um, the views on the left and the right and take flack from both sides. 
Lesson six, the exception. Um, how balanced budget legislation uh, survived in Saskatchewan? Well, you can probably tell me more about this than I can tell you. Um, but from our reading, certainly the rising potash revenues helped. There was uh, considerable volatility in potash revenues. And in 2009, the finance minister made several statements about potash revenues that he had to retract and eventually went to a five-year moving average as kind of an ad hoc admission that they had no idea where potash revenues were going. But the fact of the matter was that they had, they had a fairly uh, healthy growth in potash revenues in recent years that had helped their, their budgetary situation. There were also some expenditure discipline introduced in 2010, some tax cuts and spending was delayed. There were sin tax hikes. Uh, there was the intention to uh, constrain health uh, spending to 3.1%. I'm told that probably didn't live up to that. No other province came anywhere near that. Uh, the civil service was to shrink by 15% over four years. Remember, the balanced budget legislation only said that the civil service employment growth could not exceed the population growth in the province. So this was considerably more uh, uh, draconian than that. The um, money was taken from the stabilization fund and also from the Crown Investments Corporation to balance the budget. Um, I say balance the budget because it was pointed out that the summary budget still had a deficit of 622 million. This is a balance on, on government core operations only. Um, and also versus Alberta, um, basically Alberta and Saskatchewan did the same thing in the 2009-10 budget. Um, they both took money from the fiscal stabilization fund sufficient to balance their core operations. Uh, Saskatchewan declared a balanced budget and which is I think what you should do because that was the point of the fiscal stabilization funds. Alberta, however, said no, this, this, we, this is not a balanced budget because we took money from our savings account. So our budget is actually in deficit by this much and we're simply using this money to, to pay for that deficit. So two different approaches, but I think um, this is, the Saskatchewan one's more realistic in thinking that um, uh, you've got to have some sort of stabilization reserve to deal with these cyclical downturns. But the Saskatchewan downturn wasn't as severe as other provinces um, and the revenues were quite healthy and in 2011-2012 there are fairly modest budget surpluses. There's some tax cuts in the 2011 budget and there's indeed program spending increase of around 5% in the 2012 budget. So Saskatchewan is back on an upward trajectory in terms of program spending. Uh, the seventh and final lesson from the Great uh, Recession uh, is that governments believed they were responding to political will. When you read the, go the documents and the discussion around the, the budgets, uh, most of the governments uh, thought that this was what they were expected to do in, in governing. And in, I would point out that most of the governments were right in the sense that all, uh, the incumbent governments were all returned and all returned with majorities. The Liberals in BC in 2009, the Democrats in the Saskatchewan party in 2011, the, the Democrats in Manitoba, and the Alberta PCs in 2012, although that seemed to be a little bit iffier at the time. Um, but some, there were some punishment dealt out. Uh, Campbell resigned as BC Premier in November 2010, and Stelmack uh, stepped down as Alberta Premier in 2000, January 2011, although there were other issues around these two uh, resignations. In the case of Campbell, there was the uh, HST, harmonized sales tax and a few other uh, smoldering issues in British Columbia and Alberta. There was the resource revenue, re uh, the royalties, oil re royalties review uh, that caused a great deal of uh, turmoil in the party. And uh, indeed the close call that the Alberta PCs had in the uh, election last week suggests that they were vulnerable uh, in part as a result of the, uh, <clears throat> the fiscal measures they'd taken. And in fact the Wild Rose Party uh, called attention to some of the uh, fiscal decisions that the PCs had taken and made considerable electoral gains as a result. So what was balanced budget legislation supposed to do? Um, proponents of balanced budget legislation argued it would limit the expansion of government programs, restrict the size of the state and public debt, uh, and would force governments to subject their budgeting decisions to the court of public opinion, and implicitly these were all good things. Uh, opponents of balanced budget let, said implicitly these were all bad things, perhaps, but also they warned that it would prevent governments from running budget deficits to counteract an economic downturn. 
seems to move in different directions, different way I touch it. Uh, what did the balanced budget legislation really do? Uh, our results suggest that neither side was accurate, that uh, expenditure growth restraint was uh, not apparent in any of the provinces. Um, BC, we're not sure because depending on whether you have controls, whether you look at own source revenues uh, or all revenues, and program spending or all spending, uh, you get different answers. Uh, there seems the most uh, effective in terms of restraining expenditures, uh, but even there it's not clear. Uh, program spending outpaced own, uh, own revenue growth in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba and in the other three eastern provinces. Uh, the governments chose to protect programs and run deficits in the Great Recession, so that, kind of, that fear wasn't in fact uh, there, except for Saskatchewan, which did of course draw on its fiscal stabilization reserve, and insofar as that is an injection into the economy can be considered a fiscal stimulus. Um, and the public mood was generally supportive in Manitoba and Saskatchewan fairly clearly in Alberta and BC. And then the way forward, well, what are the options? Um, Leave the legislation as is. Manitoba says they'll return to the legislation in 2014. Uh, another one is to tinker with the legislation, as has already been done in a number of cases uh, since the original legislation was introduced, to raise the fiscal stabilization requirements, to lengthen the uh, balancing period from an annual cycle to multiple years. Uh, we could focus on long-term debt reduction rather than short-term budget balancing some sort of an annual state of the deficit and debt statement independent of the budget, much like the uh, fiscal management strategy that uh, Manitoba is required to produce. You could give that some exposure by saying this can't come out in the budget, it's got to come out at some other time of the year so that it, it gets uh, public uh, attention and in introduces some element of transparency. Uh, or you could abandon balance budget legislation um, I suppose you might say that abandoning balanced budget legislation and focusing on long-term debt reduction through one of these annual state of the deficit and debt statements might be a combination that you could consider. Um, or other more novel uh, suggestions that I haven't thought of. And I'll stop there.